picture this. You finished your first book and nailed it. The plot, the characters, all the twists and turns. This one's a winner, and all you need is the right cover. If you've got my art skills, this is the part where panic usually sets in. Enter the cover villain, hero to writers everywhere. Founded by noted author Remy Flagg, Cover Villain focuses on composite image covers for science fiction and fantasy writers. Give them the details, and they'll craft a cover using popular trends that everyone will want to see. But wait, you say, I've got ideas of my own. No problem, as Cover Villain loves a good collaboration. As they say, our goal is to put a little villain in every cover we make. Want to know more? Then head to CoverVillain.com and follow them on Facebook and Instagram. Hey everyone, how's it going? And welcome back to Citywide Blackout, your home for music, movies, and more. I'm your host, Max Bowen. In Mary Kel E. Koa's Kelly Pruitt Mystery Series, a grieving single mother inherits her late father's PI business and begins tackling mysteries on her own, leading her into dangerous territory. Kelly E. Koa has returned with a new book, Deceived. In this interview, we dive into the plot of the new story, as well as Kelly's challenges from the other two. We look at how the main character and author have grown over the years, and how Mary feels about her writing career, with three titles now released. It's really a busy few years for you. Um, you know, like three books in three years. Very, uh, uh, It's very impressive. They did want to ask about like releasing three books in, in such a short period of time. How'd you do it? Did you have like a schedule to keep? Or- Oh, I had a schedule to keep for sure. So my agent um, signed a three book deal uh, for me. And so I had to release one at the same time every year. That was the schedule. So, you know, I don't have the luxury of choosing so much. They, they tell me what I, when, when to have the book done and I, and I produced it. Thankfully, I actually had the second book drafted by the time I'd signed the contract. So I was in pretty good shape. So it wasn't too bad. Very cool. All right. What is your like writing process usually like? Well, I'm very productive and I'm very um, structured. So like I hit my office at seven o'clock every day and I usually, you know, now, now that there's Wordle, you know, I get some of these fun games out of the way before I actually focus on my writing, um, which is terrible. But anyway, we hit at seven 30, we start writing and I usually spend a good three plus hours of, um, dedicated writing time. And sometimes that includes, you know, pacing around and thinking or, you know, whatever, but it's three full hours of just writing. And I do that about six days a week, sometimes seven if I'm on a roll. So I'm very dedicated to that schedule. And so that allows me to produce quite a bit of work. Well, let us talk about the third book now. Uh, This, of course, involves uh, your main character, Kelly Pruitt, she has inherited her late father's PI business. Kelly begins searching for a client's a granddaughter and in the process uncovers a drug ring. Uh, she's then kicked off a case. Another girl goes missing. She begins working with her half-sister. Someone uh, dies in the process. This is a complicated story, but I'm curious as to how it compares to your first two books. Yeah, well, in the first two cases, um, I felt like they were a little more straightforward. You're right. The third book was a little bit twisty. And I will tell you, it it uh, kept me up a few nights because it, it was much more complicated than I had anticipated. But once I got into it, I was, I was thinking of different ways to throw the reader off and different avenues I wanted to go. And I, and it's also the third and right now the final book of the series. So not only am I trying to do a, you know, a full story, but I'm also trying to wrap up all the little tail ends that have been hanging out there. And, um, and in this particular book, she really deals with a lot of stuff around her mom and about being a mom, which really is what Kelly is about. You know, at the end of the day, it's being able to balance being a mom and career and all these things. So it was a heavier book in that sense. It, it had a little bit more of that, who Kelly is. And so it, it was complicated for sure. A so, more case. Yeah. So I'm guessing that, uh, that uh, this is not a book that you can just go by the seat of your pants. <laughs> well, I did, which is why I spent a lot of time in editing. <laughs> really? So I, I'm a pantser all the way through, which sometimes creates some problems, right? Um, <laughs> so the editing process of this book was a little bit more intense. And I ended up having to pull back on some storylines and rewrite some storylines just to get it all to flow together. I was trying to do too much in the beginning and that's 
that cost me a couple months in in edits, but you know, it's still how I produce work, right? I, I'm just a I I can't plot too much. Have you learned any good tricks for like how to avoid writing yourself into a corner? Not particularly. <laughs> <laughs> It's very well, yes honest. No. Okay. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the thing is, is I think if you write yourself into a corner, you have to get yourself out of that corner. And sometimes it makes you think about a twist or a way of approaching it that wouldn't have necessarily come through. So it's actually kind of fun sometimes, you know, if after, you know, you've thrown a few things against the wall and you're like a little stressed out by it. It's like, no, this is actually good. Now I've got a whole new approach to this. And, but, you know, I try to do it chapter by chapter by chapter and I try to, okay, what's next? What's next? What's next? And I think that helps. Um, so I do do a little bit of thought before I sit down to write that chapter that morning and really think it through a little bit. Um, but, you know, sometimes it surprises me, the directions we go. Uh, the ca- the character wants to do something totally random. And I'm like, okay, here we go. We're going to do something <laughs> random today. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Next morning when I edit, I get to rework that section again a little bit. So. All right. So do yeah. you know how your mysteries are going to end when you begin writing them? For the most part, I know what I want to accomplish, at least as far as the emotional part of it. Like, I know what I want the book to say at the end. Um, And I know where I want Kelly to be at the end. Do I always know how it's going to get there? Not necessarily. Um, Like in the book that just, it just came out deceived. um, The very, very last chapter was something that I added at the end. I I didn't realize I would add that, but it was so perfectly done. And I don't want to give it away, but you know, the, the seeds throughout, it was like, oh, we need that ending, you know, a solution or the final part of it. So sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. When have you been, I would say, like the most surprised during uh, the writing process? Have there have there been any like twists or turns that you just did not see coming at all? Gosh, that's a good question. It's hard to know through all three books. Um, I will say that sometimes we go a different direction that I didn't expect, but it doesn't necessarily come as a surprise in the sense that it's very organic and it, and it makes sense that it would go a particular way. So I may not have like thought that I was going to go that direction. Um, but then I'm like, Oh yeah, that makes total sense that it would go that direction. So. Now you are relatively new to the, uh, the novel world, these three books uh, being your first. Now that you've got your third book under your belt, are you feeling more confident as a writer? Oh, for sure. And actually I've been, you know, I've been writing those three books, but I've been doing, a lot of other writing as well. <laughs> I have a new series starting in September um, and I've already finished those two books and my agent is shopping a standalone. Uh, so, you know, I, I produce because I produce um, and publishing can be a very slow process. I just keep going. <laughs> okay. All right. I read that prior to doing other uh, novels, you had written a number of um, uh, mystery uh, short stories over the years. What would you say was the, uh, the biggest trick when it came to going from the short story to the novels? Well, you know, on a short story, you're very focused on a moment in time and it's all very compact. You don't have the luxury of going off into um, to too many avenues, right? I mean, you can, but in, and depending how short you're going to do. I mean, My Woman's World was a, a mini mystery. And at the time that I was published, it was 1,100 or 1,200 words. It was very short. <laughs> you know, that's like five or six pages of, of double space document. Um, so you know, it was quite a change because you really have to fill, you know, 90,000 words, right? That's 300 pages. And, and it's gotten a much more emotional arc in your novel writing. You've got more time to explore and to establish an arc for the character. Um, so yeah, I just think there's a whole lot, there's a whole lot of difference. (laughs) How would you say the first book compares to the third in, in, in terms of like your confidence as a writer and just the way that you approached it? Well, definitely in the first book, um, gosh, my confidence as a writer. I So the story on the first book is I actually wrote it in 1999. So I have two writing lives. I have the writing life between the ages of 27 and 35, where I actually wrote three novels that are on a shelf somewhere and then derailed. Um, you know, was the fourth novel I ever penned. And 
found, I stopped to open a company for 16 years with my husband and I came back after I turned 50 and I brought derailed out and I took a look at it and it needed a lot of work, obviously. Um, but getting that book in shape at that time actually is what helped build my confidence because the amount of editing and the amount of, you know, bringing it into the 2016 era, right? Because there was no Facebook when I wrote it in 1999. There was no Twitter. No you know, iPhones. Google, no iPads. No iPhones. That's right. You couldn't sit in your phone or your car and Google, you know, something. So, um, so much different. And so that, that actually, that editing process gave me a lot of confidence that I did maybe know what I was doing and it helped um, continue to, you know, write book two. And then even though three was the hardest book of the series to write for me, I knew I could do it at some point. Like I, I didn't, had written books before I could do this and I would find, I'd find a way to the end. Exactly. So you mentioned that you had three other books on the shelf, um, Derail uh, basically being the fourth in the series. Will those first three see the uh, light of day? No, they're not related to Kelly Pruitt. <laughs> no. Was that a quick no? <laughs> That's very, that, was, that was very no nonsense, no hesitation. No. Because every writer was, yes. has those books that they published, that they wrote when they were like, you know, teenagers or what have you. And they're like, mm -hmm. this was garbage. I never want to publish it. I'm going to bury it with me, basically. Yeah, it, they're practice novels, right? right? I mean, and they were written in like the early 90s. So, you know, gosh, even trying to bring those up to date, right, would be just a nightmare all by themselves. But, you know, I, I have different ideas constantly. Um, you know, so I don't need to go back and take a look at them. So I, they just are what they are. They're just was great practice novels. And and now I'm I'm a much better writer now. <laughs> I think you should release them. I think I think you should put them out there, you know, let the fans see them. You never know. You never know. You never know. I don't know. They're set in, uh, one of them is set in Hawaii, which, um, you know, but yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I don't think so. Fair I think enough. I have a books. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. All right. So let's talk a little more about the third book. So in this one, Kelly is, you know, she's starting to kind of feel like she's a little more confident as a PI. You know, her personal life is back on track. Um, how is she, though, in the beginning and how does she kind of grow as a character over the course of the three books? Well, in the first book, she is at a loss. She's in grief because her dad has died a year prior. Um, her marriage has uh, disintegrated and her um, ex-husband cheated with her best friend. So she's in a real low point um, in her life. And, um, and she's just kind of on cruise control. She's working process serving, which is what she's been doing all along. And she doesn't have a lot of confidence that she could do much more mostly because her dad had kept her insulated all those years. He was kind of, you know, her mom dies at 14 and then she's kind of, he's grieving. So she's just kind of a caretaker emotionally for him doing what she can in the business and away she goes. But as through the course of the series, she's, you know, she catches the bad guy at the end of book one and then gives her a little bit more confidence. Um, and so in book two, she's um, actually helping a friend uh, find her missing father. And then, so throughout book two, she's resolving some of her own issues that we find out in book one um, with her own dad. And by book three, she's feeling like a legit, you know, a legit PI. It's like, okay, I've got two cases under my belt, you know? <laughs> so um, she's starting to feel pretty good, although life is still throwing quite a bit, few obstacles at her. And, uh, and of course, she gets fired, as you mentioned, in book three. And so she has enough confidence that it really doesn't matter whether she's getting a paycheck or not. She's going to solve this case for um, many reasons. And one of them is, is because she's not going to let young women out there be missing. It doesn't matter whether she's getting a paycheck. She's going to find them. Yeah. What about Kelly's, Kelly's dad? Who is he? And how does he kind of inspire her to sort of pick up the mantle? Well, Roger, his name was Roger Pruitt and r &K Investigations is the name of their uh, you know, Roger and Kelly. Um, and he was, he was a great investigator. Um, but the problem is she didn't know a lot about him because he held so much, so much close to the vest. He, she didn't know all the things that he did. Um, some things, uh, she finds out were not so great. Some things she reads wrong, um, as she finds out the information, but she wants to be him for a lot of her, the series. Um, 
and she wants to be half as good as he is. I mean, she almost knows, she doesn't believe she can actually be him at all. And I think that's part of her growth process. And what she learns at the end is she doesn't actually have to be her dad. She actually can be a PI in her own right with her own definition of what success is to that. So, hmm. but he definitely inspires her throughout. Okay. Does uh does Kelly ever deal with like imposter syndrome? She feels like, oh, I'm I'm only here because like my dad started the business. You know, I don't I don't think so. Only in the sense that originally she didn't really think she would go into investigating. So she's she's she knows she's not you know half as good. Um, but as she does get some wins, she does believe that the wins are hers. Like she figured them out and. So she gains some of that confidence. She still doesn't think she's as good as he is, but, you know, but she doesn't feel like she has to be at the end. So this may be a bit of a spoiler question, but will his death ever come up like later in the series as like an unsolved mystery kind of thing? Not his. Ah, fair <laughs> enough. Not his death. Ah, uh, okay. Ah, okay. But, you know what? But we'll say yeah. no more. You got to read we'll the books no and more. find out. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Um, now I'm curious about her again, like stepping up to kind of take over the, over over the other uh, business. But does she have like other plans for life? Does she have other things you want to do? And this kind of became her new thing. Well, she had she was pretty content with being Mitz's mom, which is her deaf daughter, and her daughter is deaf. So you know she did um, she did some you know extra parenting, obviously, right? Because she did have her daughter, um, and. But she was very content with what she was doing, being a mom and being a process server. That that worked pretty well for her, although she did want more. She just was used to being told no. So it just it kind of worked that way. She also married Jeff and Jeff was her um, sweetheart from five years old. They'd been on and off again. He was a, her neighbor, right? The, the boy next door type of thing. But he had really old fashioned ways about um, or thoughts and ideas about what a woman should or shouldn't be doing in her career. So I think she just kind of goes with the flow for a long time and then life implodes on her and she's forced to 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 do something different. So now she's embracing it with both hands and, and going and never, ever listen to Jeff. He's never right. Jeff is ne almost never right. No, yes. exactly. exactly. <laughs> but, but let's talk about like the old fashioned notions, because usually in these books, not all of them, of course, but, you know, in a good in a good chunk of them, uh, it's a guy who's the, who's the main character. He's usually like a former cop or something like that. Special Forces, okay. Army. And then we have Kelly, who's kind of the opposite of all these things. How does she kind of fit into like the mystery genre as a whole? Well, I, more and more women are definitely being um, seen as PIs, but you're right. I mean, male domination in that um, particular genre, you know, is pretty heavy, right? Um, of course, you've, we've got Sarah Paretsky and Tracy Clark and Sue Grafton, of course, was paving the way long before um, on all of this and, and putting a female in. Um, but she definitely, there's a place for Kelly, though, as a PI, because there's a place for women in all male <laughs> in type of, you know, I mean, you can do both genders in any type of role. And I love, I love being able to write her as a strong woman, but she does have some issues, right? She, she has society's view of what she can and cannot be doing as a mom. And as a woman, she's always facing that. Um, and it just adds another layer of challenge, which is fun to write and figure out as we go. Mm-hmm. Does she have to work hard to kind of prove herself? Does she ever get dismissed as like, oh, you can't be here. You're just a woman. You let some guy do it. Well, definitely. I mean, it's not always blatant in the books, but it's definitely an undertone right through throughout. Um, and she gets quite a bit of that just even from her ex-husband and her ex-mother-in-law. And, and that is just like you need to be doing something else. You shouldn't be doing what you're doing. But I think people don't take her seriously. She's not in a seasoned PI, number one. She's a newer PI when the series first starts. And so people aren't necessarily going to think she's um, worth talking to. Um, but, you know, she just it just makes her um, mad a little bit and try a little harder. <laughs> she's mm -hmm. just not going to be dismissed at the end of the day. So, Does Kelly feel like out of her depth dealing with these cases? I mean, like you said, she before this was a process server. And here she is investigating like missing persons, drug rings. Uh, kidnappings and murders. Yeah, she definitely feels out of her depth sometimes. And it gets her into trouble sometimes. I mean, I think 
you know, I think when it's really simple, because she, you know, as a process server, that's not necessarily a safe job either. Sometimes, you know, if you're dealing with domestic abuse or, you know, different people don't always want to be subpoenaed to trials. And, you know, that's her job is to knock on those doors and, and hand those papers. Um, but PI definitely is a little bit more dangerous. And, um, and when the danger does step in, I think that's when she does feel even more out of her depth, like when it's targeted at her or when, um, you know, she's going into a dark alleyway or, you know, something like that. I think those are when she feels the most intimidated. Um, but she's just, she's just kind of a bull in a China shop sometimes. And she just kind of goes with it, <laughs> you know? And I think her way through fear is direct a lot of times because that's how her dad was. And she compares. So that's when she really compares to her dad. She'll be like, well, Ro my dad would not back down from this. And because he won't back down, I can't back down. So hmm. here I go. <laughs> so it sounds to me like Kelly's not this like ass kicker type of character. It sounds like she's a little more used to a sort of quieter pace. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I mean, she can certainly be a butt kicker when she needs to be. <laughs> And I think she gets stronger through the series. And that's part of her, her learning curve too, is that, um, and, but also that she doesn't always have to be so, you know, blustery about it either. Like she can do it from a more mature, you know, centered position um, and still get what she wants in a case and what she wants in her, in her world as well. Now we talked a lot about Kelly. Clearly you, uh, you knew her uh, very well. What were you into crafting the character? Well, you know, I, I tell this story a lot that Kelly actually came to me. Um, I didn't necessarily create Kelly. Um, I was reading Sue Grafton quite a bit at the time, and I was working in the legal field, and I was working with PIs and, and different um, aspects, which worked great because I had, you know, front row and lots of um, people to talk to. But I had just decided I wanted to write a PI novel. And the moment that I'd actually written that on the piece of paper, Kelly Pruitt was this next thing I wrote down. And suddenly it was just like, there she was, you know, single mom to a deaf daughter, ex-husband, ex-mother-in-law next door, got a love interest in a cop. Okay, there she is, you know, and, you know, she's developed in, you know, over time, she was a little snarkier in the beginning. And I've toned her down a little bit as I've gone through the edit process because publishers, you know, had had their influence and their opinions on different things and <laughs> and all of that. But, you know, who she was really came through right from the beginning. You mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the publishers, and certainly the editing process, a lot can be lost. Have you ever had a moment, though, where you kind of put your foot down and said, no, we can't lose this thing, it's got to stay? You know, I never felt, mm -hmm. I, yes and no. I mean, it, I had a pretty tough editor. So I didn't always get to negotiate some things. It was sort of like, this is kind of just the way it needs to be. Or, you know, I love my publisher. I don't mean to say that, but she just had opinions, right? That just sometimes, but you know, the one thing that I have, I'm pretty good at is being flexible. And if you want to be traditionally published, you don't, there's not a lot of hills you should be dying on because I figure, you know, I always think it's pay grade, right? This, I keep to what I do well, I write books. But publishers know what sells, and I kind of trust that process. So if people if people want changes, I, I look at it. Sometimes I don't agree. I have my freak out moment. I'll be like, "What? Why? What do you tell me? What do you mean right now?" Um, but then I come back and I'll be like, "Yeah, you know, it works, and I can make that happen." So, um, and at the end of the day, I love Kelly Pruitt, and I love the work that I produced and the stuff that's out on the market. So, no complaints about it whatsoever. And I think that it's very easy to have that like hill to die on moment where it's like, no, 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 this is my thing. It's my child. You can't change it. <laughs> oh, it's absolutely human. Yeah. Yeah. And I think every, I, I think a writer's lying to you if they say, anytime somebody says change this, they're like, oh yeah, no problem. You know, like, <laughs> it's like, oh no, oh no, I don't. Yeah, but you have to be able to come back and say, okay, I think I can make that work. Um, because I do want, I do want the traditional publishing you know, right, route, and that's that's the uh, trade off sometimes. Did Kelly have a number of iterations before you kind of came with a version that you said, "Yep, this is the one I'm going to go with"? Well, I came with her pretty a little bit on the snarkier side. That was what I came with, and I and I did like her. Um, 
but you know, there was just, there was, she was a little snarkier and I, you gotta remember I was writing her when I was 35. So I was a little, I was a different person at that age, right? <laughs> when I first wrote her, um, you know, 16 years is a long time to have somebody on a shelf. And then you're like, okay, yeah, let's soften her up a little bit here, a little bit there. And, um, and one thing, you know, that was interesting is I was paralleling Kelly in a lot of ways at that age, right? Cause my character's 32. I was 35. I was a new step parent. She's a single mom, you know, so we had some different things, balanced career. So, but you know, when you, get farther ahead in life, you can look back and say, yeah, maybe we can tone her down just a little bit. So the, the tone, what you see now in the books is the little bit toned version, but she still has her little snark here and there for sure. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I'm curious if you gave a lot of thought to the market itself, like when you were crafting the character, crafting the story, did you really think a lot about like, okay, will this sell? I didn't actually. No, I just wrote I wrote a PI novel because I was a big fan of PI novels and I wanted a female because I was a big fan of, you know, Kinsey Milhone. And, you know, it was really just, I wrote what I loved to read at the time and I didn't really think about it. Um, I, I just didn't actually think that it wouldn't sell really, to be honest. I was like, people love PI novels, right? They love mysteries. So I just kept to that. At the same time though, I think there is a ton of them out there. There's a lot of like, thrillers and mystery novels so when you were uh, writing yours did you spend a lot of time thinking okay how do I make this unique from like everyone else well I think it just kind of happened in the sense that when Kelly came to me kind of fully formed she was different right because you don't see a lot of single moms out there working PI and um and the deaf daughter aspect um I thought was different enough as well so I think just by accident, she was different enough. I didn't really, you know, pre-think that too much. But I was lucky enough that she was a little different. So. Okay. Does her being a single mom or the parent of a deaf child, does it really factor into the story a lot? Well, the balancing act, right? So because a PI can be called to work seven days a week late into the night. And she does run into a little bit of problem because she shares custody with her ex-husband and he lives in Washington, which is close to the state school for the deaf. And she lives in Portland in her childhood home, which is where she went after she got divorced. And so there is that balancing, but she has mitts over the weekend and sometimes, you know, a suspect needs to be um, (laughs) interviewed over the weekend. And sometimes that creates some where she needs to ask for a little help from her ex-mother-in-law. So it does come up in the, in the book quite a bit that she's balancing her career and motherhood at the same time, which is a very common issue among most people or most women out there. So. I'm curious as to if there's anything kind of inspired you to say, you know what, I want to write this book. Like now's the time to do it. Well, just that, you know, I, cause I wrote it in 99 and, um, at the time I just, I, I decided I want to write a P not PI novel. When I came back to it in, in, uh, 2016, I did feel like I really did not want to give up on that book. Um, because I felt that the story was strong enough and I really loved the characters. So I don't know if that counts or not, but I just, I just knew that I wanted to keep, you know, going and I did, you know, I had many, many, many edits, over 100 rejections on this book um, before I got an agent. Yeah. So, I mean, I was dedicated. I knew it would sell at some point. I believed in her that much. So I never I never stopped believing in Kelly. <laughs> but 100 rejections. I mean, geez. Yeah. How'd you kind of kind of uh, um, keep it going as the rejections just kind of piled up? Yeah. Boy, it wasn't easy. <laughs> there were some days, right? But, you know... I think what really helped is any agent that was willing to give me a little bit of feedback. I took, I would go back through the book and I would try to improve it and see it through those new set of eyes. Um, You know, that new perspective, Um, you know, so I really took it as a learning uh, experience in a lot of ways. And I just, I, I, I'm pretty tenacious, you know, I don't, (laughs) I don't really say no or take no for an answer over, over time. You know, I was like, I just knew it would go. I just needed to figure it out. And of course, at the same time, I'm learning my craft too. I'm getting better as a writer. Every time I'm going through it, every time I get feedback or I'm taking classes and, you know, I did entered it into pitch wars where I had a mentor um, and she was giving me feedback. And, you know, so I think I just kind of took it in as a, as learning 
a process. So, and I got the yes eventually. There you go. <laughs> there you go. What would you say was the best feedback you ever got? Cause and effect. Cause and effect. That was the best um, advice I ever got. They're like, you know, the plot is great and all this, but the cause and effect is not there. Um, and I guess when I was first doing my books in in the uh, when I was 27 and stuff, that was just not a skill I had learned. Right. So I, I didn't have it in my Kelly Pruitt book. And when I went really back through and made sure that every time she acted, it was based on a thread from the previous. Um, and she wasn't just doing things randomly, <laughs> which apparently is not, wasn't a good thing. And when you're writing a mystery, <laughs> no random, must have reasons. Um, it just improved. It took me to another level as a writer. And um, I think that was the thing that, that finally got it over the crest. So. All right. We mentioned earlier about how the first book was written like 16 uh, years ago. Uh, you have to update for things like the tech used, vehicles, settings. But do you ever have to like update like the, just the mood of the times? Yeah. Well, I changed. I had to change some of the people's names a little bit, you know, um, and just some of the language because you know a 32 year old back in 1999 is not the same 32 year old today. <laughs> It's totally different. Um, so some of the language and just the references, um, you know, just that type of thing. Yeah. So the vibe of the book had to change just a little bit. So, and of course, like you said, all the technology. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't have like iPhones back then, I'm afraid. No, no, not at all. Big clunky computers. <laughs> exactly. I was curious though, from someone who has been writing these books for a little while now, how does the tech kind of factor into things? Well, it it's a challenging. It's in some ways because you know you can find out so much information sitting behind your computer um, and scanning social media, but that doesn't make for a very interesting book, does it? <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah. I, I don't think My, like I don't think like um like uh, chapter four. Kelly spends like three hours on uh, Facebook. <laughs> Yeah, that's, yeah, that has to take all of about a half a page and, you know, she's got to go out now and act on it. Um, so, it, you know, it's a challenge because, you know, it's like um, suspending belief that she wouldn't spend three or four hours doing that versus running out to go, why would she do that when she could just stay home and hang out with Floyd, her dog, and, you know, eat popcorn with mitts, right? But um, so it just adds that another layer of challenge that you have to balance in and give good reasons why she's taking those extra steps, those extra interviews, things like that. So, Now, your own background is as a legal secretary, so certainly it gives you a lot of insight. But how did this kind of shape the story as a whole? Oh, gosh. You know, just the investigative side, I think, is was one of those things that I was able to transfer. I've always been um, very, you know, inquisitive and curious with lots of questions. And so that definitely you know, transferred over into Kelly. Um, and, and just kind of knowing legally, you know, of course, every state is different and PI is different, but just kind of knowing where to go and how to get those questions answered, definitely transferred over for sure. So it, it's been a great asset for sure. I'll bet. I'll bet. Are there any stereotypes or tropes of like mystery novels that you kind of try to avoid? Well, the biggest trope that you f see in PIs, or maybe not the biggest, but, you know, is the the lone wolf with, um, you know, addiction issues, <laughs> right? Um, like, right? Like the PI who's, you know, the lone wolf and gets drunk every night and that. So obviously Kelly couldn't do those types of things. She's a mom and we're not going to have her uh, drinking on the job <laughs> and being a bad role model because what of what part of what drives Kelly is to be showing her daughter that she can be anything she wants in life, right? So that is a trope that I did try to avoid. Um, anything that was a bad habit in that sense um, but Kelly does have the lone wolf trope going a little bit, and that is uh, what she needs to overcome through the book, though, where many times in PIs, they just remain lone wolves. She's actually trying to learn to, to receive some help and realize she doesn't have to do it all alone. So I really wonder how that came to be, because you raise a good point. Like there's so many detective novels where like the main character, he's a habitual smoker or like a heavy drinker or something. And it just seems weird uh, to not have that element in the story. 
Yeah, probably, you know, from the noir time frames, you know, and the older, um, you know, authors that, that that was just kind of sexy at that point in time, right? The lone wolf, and cigar hanging out, you know, the whiskey or the high highball, right? I don't know. That's what I'm thinking. And it's just kind of carried over that, you know, and it's a grittier, dirtier, da- more dangerous job, right? So you're going to have somebody who's a little bit rougher on the edge and living on the edge a little bit. Um, kind of like on that skirting the law type of character. And I think it's just translated into today. It's just, yeah. I think it carried over. I think if if you were to like do it in today's terms, Kelly's Diction would either be like Facebook arguments or <laughs> just like researching like random topics. Yeah, probably. <laughs> it's probably true. She does have a peanut butter addiction, but that's like the only thing. And she likes her coffee black from 7-Eleven. But, you know, the- <laughs> Jeez. She, she, she lives dangerously. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's yeah, the worst that it gets for her. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. That's pretty bad, I think. That's pretty bad. <laughs> How about developing the cases? The, does the background kind of help you create more like, believable or realistic cases? Oh. I don't know. I used to do insurance defense, so probably not a whole lot of, you know, carryover. Although I did do a stint for a little bit for a public defender, and that was interesting, of course. Um, you know, I think it just, you know, it's always a barometer of like what whether it it's real or not. I don't think the background necessarily helps with that. I think um, I definitely run most of a lot of my ideas or I fact check a lot with a, um, a homicide detective I know. Uh, that helps quite a bit. So I think if nothing else, my connections from my times, you know, being in the industry and that help. So is there a certain line that you won't cross in terms of like the intensity of the cases? I don't know that I'd ever kill a child in my books um, and I would never harm an animal. Those are just two things that I I would not do. Those are lines I won't cross. You know, no animals or children will die <laughs> in my novels. Um <laughs> And I'm not really into graphic violence for the sake of graphic violence. I, you know, if it's appropriate and somebody has to be shot and bleed out, whatever, you know, but it's, (laughs) but it's going to be, it's not going to be gratuitous and it's not going to be, um, I'll leave a lot to your imagination. How's that? And if Kelly ever gets this animal sidekick, we can, we can rest assured it will make it until the end. Well, Floyd is her sidekick, yes, ah. and he does make it to the end. Yes, Floyd, no, nothing bad ever happens to Floyd. Although I've had a, I've had a couple of writers or readers who've sent me emails and said, when you did this, I thought something was going to happen to Floyd, and I was going to throw the book across the room. <laughs> I was like, I would never hurt Floyd. <laughs> Which I think is just the reaction you want. You want them to get so invested that yeah. when something happens, they don't want. They get furious with you. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. That means they're invested in the, in the story and they like the characters and there's really no higher compliment, to be honest. Oh, definitely. So, definitely. How about yeah. taking bad feedback? Do you ever kind of cringe or you get an email from a readers thinking, oh God, what's it going to be? What's it going to be? <laughs> I've never had a bad email come from a reader, knock on wood. And I try not to read my reviews because I think it brings you down a little bit when you don't need to be down. <laughs> There's too many other things in the world, so you just don't need to volunteer yourself for those types. Really? You've never read a review? Well, I I, know. I didn't say never. I say I try not to read Ah. them, though. (laughs) I did read some, and that's why I try not to read them, (laughs) you know. You know. And it's it's funny because it wasn't really that it was bad or or anything, um, but it's sort of like there's so many good ones, right? So... Why look at the negatives, right? There are too many good ones. So we'll we'll go with those. It can be tough, especially when, given something that you have spent so many years on is almost like your child. You've created this whole world for someone to say, oh, oh yeah. this is garbage. Well, yeah. And I think the comment was more like, you know, just c- couldn't connect, couldn't do this, couldn't do that, you know, um, you know, just mediocre, you know, that type of thing. And But here's the thing. Art is subjective. Oh, and yeah. I, you are never, ever, ever going to get everybody to love your work, no matter what you do. You know, yeah. 99 people could love it, and there's going to be that one that hates it. And I write for the 99, you know. I can't control the one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there is a great comedian who uh, once said, one man's To Kill a Mockingbird is another man's Twilight Saga. 
And I think right? it's very true. You know, there are some people who who, uh, who will say that, you know, Harper Lee is the greatest author in the history of mankind. Mm-hmm. And others will say the Twilight Saga sets the bar for everyone else. It varies. It it really does. It's so it's just, you know, people look at the world through the lens of the of their own life, you know. So um, you know, maybe Kelly didn't appeal to them for whatever reason. Um but it's okay. You're entitled to your opinion. I, yeah, I'm good. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> it's okay. Speaking of the lens of your own life, do you ever bring people or situations into your books that that like you've experienced directly? Well, the answer has to be no to that. <laughs> wink, wink. No, um, no, of course not. I, but I think you know personalities are and characters are always a compilation of people that you meet and interactions you've had. Um, but I do not ever put somebody specifically in my books or a situation necessarily specifically. It can be inspired, however, by situations and people. <laughs> ah, okay. Now, is that a PC answer? <laughs> it was a very, very PC answer, actually. Now, and now I'm very, very curious. Well, oh, which characters? <laughs> well, pretty much all of them, really, when you think about it. I mean, you know, the ex Jeff, and, you know, there could be some, you know, compilations of people in there and um the ex-mother-in-law although i love my ex i love my mother-in-law so i mean yeah not my ex i've been married 34 years so i love my mother-in-law um but you know for sure there's personality types that i've worked with at the legal field or i you know after i left law i actually opened up retail stores and um in the pet natural pet industry that's my day job um and uh yes let me tell you retail it's just, it's a, yeah, lots of uh, inspiration for characters <laughs> in a retail setting. What, one of these days, one of the readers who has like been like in your store or the, or that you work with is going to read the book and be like, hey. Hey, this is I me. recognize. Yeah. <laughs> no, usually people that you're writing on that level don't recognize themselves quite often. <laughs> exactly. So. Exactly. Okay. Now, where you are now, uh, three books in. Do you feel like you're more established as a novelist? I mean, yeah, I, I would think so to some degree. I mean, I definitely have continued to build um, more readership as I've gone. And I can tell that from the interactions I get, you know, and the feedback I get and the reviews I get. Um, you know, I don't know that you ever feel like you're where you want to be quite yet. But, you know, every book just builds on itself. And, you know, I'm I'm where I... I feel that I'm in a really good place for being two years out as an author hmm. and I'm having fun, which is, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> That's key. That's key. Especially given the amount of work you gotta love it. Otherwise it's just gonna be misery. Absolutely. Absolutely. How about building your readership? What would you say was the toughest part of that? Well, just being a debut novelist during the pandemic, I think, was, you know, <laughs> a challenge, right? Um, I couldn't be out doing any events. Um, I couldn't be out meeting people or the libraries are shut down, you know, bookstores are shut down. And all of a sudden we're all flooding on to zoom and social media at the same time. And, um, you know, I think that was a challenge for sure. So, but, you know, you just, I think the important thing is for any author, you just do you. And, you know, I think people gravitate towards that and, um, yeah, but that was a challenge for sure. This, so. this actually reminds me of an interview I did a while back. It was actually shortly after COVID hit. There was a writer who was putting out his first book. He had this big, you know, book release party planned. 200 people were, were going to be there. And the whole thing gets shut down. Did yeah. that happen to you? Did you have to, like, really change your release strategy when COVID hit? Oh, for sure. Um, you know, I was planning to be at a local bookstore. And, you know, I was thinking of hors d'oeuvres and, you know, like, well, I wonder if I should do this or do that. And, um, and then, cause I had a May release date and, and then in March, you know, everything gets shut down. So I had to go, I found a, a launch party on Facebook. Um, and I did an, a virtual launch basically. And I had a great time. It was very fun, but very different. It did not look at all like I had thought, you know, when you've written, for so many years, like, you know, this was like year 10 or 12 of my writing life, you know, you think, gosh, I finally get to have a party with my friends and, uh, and celebrate this. And yeah, but that's okay. 
<laughs> it worked okay. Hey, you move on. You move on. Have you had the That's chance right. to do more in-person events? Not quite yet. A lot of places are still not quite opened yet. Um, like they are, but they aren't necessarily bringing people in for events. Like you can come in and shop, but they're not, you know, like uh, Annie Bloom's Books, which is down the road. Um, they are just opening to in-person events at this point. And so as that tends to get more and more, I think I will definitely be creating more of those, of those opportunities. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Now, of course, the, the uh, release of Deceived is a very, very big deal, but that's not all. <laughs> you also have a new series uh, uh, coming out in September called uh, the Misty Pine series featuring Sheriff Jax Turner. What is this one going to be all about? Yeah, so Jax Turner is a former Portland homicide detective, and he moved down to the Oregon coast. Misty Pines is a fictional Oregon coast town, um, and he he left uh, a cold case, a uh, 25-year-old cold case, and he married his FBI wife, and they, like I said, they moved. But this case is a missing 14-year-old girl, um, and he is finding signs that the 14-year-old current missing girl might have ties to the 25-year-old cold case. And so the two are going to intersect throughout the book. So I'm very excited about it. It's, it's um, I grew up uh, down at the Oregon coast. And so I, I got to use a lot of places I understood. And that particular case was actually inspired by um, a true crime that happened in my hometown in 1979. So it, you know, where two girls were out walking on a country road and one came home and one didn't. So that's the cold case in it. And uh, yeah, so it's it's inspired and it's in an area that I love and I'm I'm excited for the series. Hmm. So, Who is Jax Turner? You gave us like a bit of background, but where does Jax come from? You know, he is kind of that old school, uh, former military, a uh, little bit hardcore detective. Um, but very, um, very like, hmm, how do I want to say it? He's very, like one of the things you don't, you find out right from the very beginning is he lost his daughter to leukemia and he's never gotten over it. So that is like the core of who he is. He's an investigator. He's actually on the verge of suicide in the very first chapter because he's so upset about having, like he hasn't been able to, to get over it. Um, and then he's called for this missing girls case and the 25 year old case haunts him. So he feels it's quite fitting that he has one last missing child case before he ends it. And of course that's the arc through the book is whether he will or won't go back to the beach to do what he was going to do in the beginning of the book. So it's a, a very emotional, um, impactful story, uh, as he goes through and, um, finds out what happened. So that is we'll see. dark. Wow. <laughs> it's a little darker than Kelly Pruitt. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sure. I mean like Kelly and her, like uh, a faithful companion Floyd and her, like a uh, love of um, mm -hmm. uh, peanut butter and 7-Eleven and coffee mm -hmm. versus Jax Turner, who was right to just end it all. What's it like getting in a, that person's head though? You know, he was very easy to write um, for whatever reason. And I can't, I can't even tell you why I just, Jax Turner was easy to write. Um, and, and he was, it was easy to get in. I don't know. He just kind of, um, it was a very inspired book. And I think that was part of it. And he reminds me of so many men that I've known in my life, my dad and, you know, my brother-in-law, just that, that more military mindset. And so I think I was able to really relate to that as well. Cause I grew up with that and, um, but, but he's a great character. So. Okay. Yeah. Will Kelly and Jax ever cross paths? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> I don't see how that would happen necessarily. I don't see how yeah. they would actually get along because I feel like Kelly would get dismissed a lot. <laughs> well, he's not that. You know, Jax's ex-wife is FBI agent and her name's Abby Kanikoa. And she really, you see her a lot in the second book, but she plays a good part in the first book. So, um and she's a tough lady. So, you know, he doesn't dismiss women because she wouldn't have that. <laughs> Abby wouldn't allow that. So. Okay. Um, do you think there'll ever be an audiobook version of this? 
of the Kelly Pruitt mm. or the, yeah. Um, you know, my publisher has uh, been talking about it, but I don't know yet. Ooh, yeah. I hope so. Because this, uh, I think would make an absolutely amazing audiobook. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. I'm hoping for sure. Hidden pieces will be, um, I'm being told that it will be, but yeah, I think Kelly Pruitt definitely needs to be a, needs to be one. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, Mary, thank you so much for joining me. I really enjoyed uh, talking about the Kelly Pruitt series and folks, if you haven't checked this out, definitely do so. You go uh, to Mary, um, Kelly com. That's K E L I I K O A.com. You'll find all the information there. Get it in print. Get it in in ebook formats. If go go to your local bookstore, request a copy. Get it on the shelf. And certainly, we say this a lot, but follow her socials. She's on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Interact. Leave a comment. Leave a review. Leave a like. Whatever you want. But interaction. <laughs> it's a big part of uh, helping these authors get more out there and seen by the rest of the world. And Mary, once again, thank you so very much. Thank you for having me. Take care. Hi, this is singer Kate Eppers, and you're listening to Citywide Blackout. Okay, everyone, that brings this episode to a close. Big thanks to Mary for joining me, and definitely check out her books, available in print, ebook, and soon, audiobook. Personally, I can't wait for the last one. You can follow the show on Facebook under Citywide Blackout, and Twitter and Instagram under Citywide Max. Get at me at citywidemax at yahoo.com, and check out the show wherever you find podcasts, as well as every Saturday at 10 p.m. on Boston Free Radio. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.